that China has launched an unprecedented mission to the far side of the moon. The unmanned Chang'e 6 a probe lifted off from the southern island province of Hainan. It's expected to return in around two months with around two kilos of lunar samples. The launch is the latest advance in China's ambitious space exploration program, which now rivals that of the United States. China made history in 2019 when it became the first country to land a rover on the moon's far side. So here's more about Beijing's latest moon mission. Chang'e 6 aims to collect lunar material from the far side of the moon and bring it back to Earth. It's a complex mission that will involve several robotic modules working together. The 8-metre-long spacecraft will first orbit the moon and then deploy a lander to the side that is never visible from Earth. It will target the South Pole Aitken Basin, the largest known impact crater in the solar system. Using a mechanical drill and scoop, the lander will collect two kilos of soil and rocks. An ascender module attached to the lander will blast back into lunar orbit and transfer the samples to the re-entry vehicle. If all goes well, it will carry the cargo safely back to Earth. Scientists hope the sample will reveal new information about the Moon's early evolution. Its far side is geologically different from the one we see from Earth. It has a thicker crust, and its surface rock has different chemical composition. Chang'e 6 also has instruments made in Europe on board. A spectrometer from Sweden will investigate the interaction between solar winds and the lunar surface. When solar winds sweep across the moon, they create an electric charge that can endanger astronauts and equipment. The effect is most pronounced on the crater edges in the polar regions. This research trip will pave the way for China's first crewed moon landing, which it hopes to achieve by 2030. Both the US and China want to establish bases at the moon's South Pole. Svetlana Benitsak is an assistant professor specializing in space security at Johns Hopkins University. She joins us from uh, Washington. Uh, welcome to DW. The last couple of years has seen China and the US and India all landing on the moon. What do you think is behind this accelerated lunar action? Um, thank you for having me and for inviting me um, to your show. Uh, well, uh, space in general, space capabilities, support and enhance services, infrastructures, development, security back at home. And at the same time, they add to uh, those countries' international prestige and a sense of national pride uh, domestically. Uh, they also help development back home. Um, so I think there are several drivers behind those recent um, events in space. It does seem to have uh, accelerated, though, over these last few years. It seems to have sort of right. reached a race. <laughs> yes, uh, many would. Uh, many have described uh, what is happening currently as a race. Um, and one could potentially see that as a race because we are all trying to get to the same place, uh, the South Pole of the Moon, around the same time frame. Uh, and uh, various countries are developing um, capabilities to that end. Um, however, the Moon in itself is not an end point per se, as perhaps we'll have more time to discuss. It is just a stepping stone toward future missions, toward future exploration of space. Uh, so it is very difficult to describe it as a race if there's no end in sight. Right. Now, you, you mentioned in, in the, the list of reasons why, why uh, countries might be going up there, uh, science and technology, but buried within that was the, the military uh, aspect. Should we presume that there are militaries around the world looking at how they can actually use the moon? Absolutely. Actually, the militarization of space has been with us 
since the dawn of the space age, the 1950s, uh, the militarization of space is simply using space to support uh, military missions back on Earth. Uh, what we should be worried about is actually the weaponization of space, using space for offensive purposes. Uh, now, I, mu I must say that all the missions that have been announced, that, that have been conducted so far, including um, those to the moon, uh, so all those missions uh, are and have been announced as scientific missions with the goal to explore, to learn, and to prepare for eventual human settlements on the moon and beyond. In fact, the Outer Space Treaty, ratified by all major spacefaring countries, actually specifically forbids the establishment of military bases, of military installations, of any sort of military fortifications, as well as the testing of any types of weapons and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies, including the moon. So um, so the offensive side of that, the, the offensive use of space is forbidden in international space law. However, the use of military personnel for scientific research and for any other purposes is actually allowed. Um, so according to current international space law, in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon, all countries should be guided by the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance and so far, all announced missions um, are with the goal to explore, okay. to learn, and to study. I mean, but, but that, that sounds great in theory, and it's good to know that there are rules governing uh, who can do what up there. But, <clears throat> excuse me, if we look at, at China, who's just has sent this, uh, this latest mission up, if we look at what China is doing down here on Earth in the South China Sea, well, you right. look at the, the idea that they want to establish a base up on the moon and you would ask yourself, right. well, why wouldn't they want to claim it for their own? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, anybody can claim anything uh, <laughs> in space. Even individuals have claimed uh, asteroids actually in space, uh, as it was the case of Eros. Uh, that was claimed by, by an American individual. So anybody can go plant a flag and claim a space, even without the planting the flag, uh, anybody can claim anything. Uh, but really, uh, the, the, the reality is that space is very difficult and to um, assert uh, sort of ownership of something in space, you also have to be able to defend it, um, to hold on to that position. Um, and, and first we have to say that international law, the outer space law forbids uh, the national appropriation of um, of anything in space. Uh, so China cannot just claim um, something because, um, because it wants to do so. Uh, but even if it does, even if it decides to go against international space law, that risks aggravating its standing in the international community. And as I said before, space is very hard. It is very difficult to actually achieve anything in space alone, what? which is one of the reasons actually China partnered, uh, China is not going alone to the moon, it is actually going together with 10 other states and several non-governmental entities. Just a quick word on, because we know that when these missions go up there, they, uh, they gather up kilos of dust and bring it down to earth and examine it. What happens? Uh, what are the rules around treasures found on the moon? If they bring back some, uh, some fantastic superconducting rare earth, do they get to just, is it finders keepers or are there more rules that say, no, you can't do that? And then how do you enforce those rules? This is, Phil, this is an excellent question. It's a question actually that is currently being explored and discussed uh, at the United Nations. Uh, what exactly are the rules of extracting and using in situ elements, um, in situ uh, resources? Uh, what exactly is a space resource? How much can we extract? Uh, do we have the right to extraction? How much uh, can we do uh, if we do? Um, the matter of the fact is that we have brought back samples from the moon before, including China with Chang'e 5 in 2020, uh, actually four pounds of it uh, at that time. The Apollo uh, astronauts also brought samples uh, from the moon. So, um, Precedents show uh, has shown have precedents have shown that we can bring samples back from the moon at least four pounds, and that will be that 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 hasn't 
posed a problem. Uh, however, the rules are still being defined okay. uh, and discussed at the international level. Uh, so we'll see how that, that goes. And so which country do you think, or which super rich individual is closest uh, to establishing a base on the moon? This is uh, <laughs> this is this is an excellent question, and I'm I'm very happy that you actually opened it up not only for states, but uh, just based on what the various entities have said. Right now, Artemis three, that is slated to be the first crewed mission uh, on the moon, landing on the moon. Uh, from the Artemis program. So this one is scheduled for September 2026. They plan to use a Starship lander developed by SpaceX that is still actually undergoing testing. Uh, China uh, and the China-led bloc has quoted actually several dates between 2026 and 2030. Uh, it definitely plans to land Taikonauts on the moon by 2030. So based on those very preliminary announcements, it would seem like it could be the Artemis block. But as you pointed out, um, there have been other um, the countries that they've also landed successfully on the moon, including India in 2023, and several others that attempted to land on the moon, including um, Israel and Japan. And then, of course, we have individuals um, actually... Uh, Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin is right. very interested. It's all going to get very. Crater. It's all going to get very crowded Water. up there. Um, thank you yeah, so much for, yes. for guiding us yes, through of that. Uh, Svetlana Ben Itzak yes. from Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much. Thank you.